we wanted for you to have a guest like Baisaki. She's in the country for some months. And this is a question, a QR session. You can ask her questions like some people were asking some questions already. So please give her a hand. Thank you for the introduction, Liana. Hi. Um, so I'm here with you. Uh, before in the past, I did a lot of activities with this university, but now I'm here just for a short period and uh, Liana invited me to talk to you all about peace. Uh, maybe because I have traveled all over the world, I have lived in five continents on student exchange programs like Intercambios, always with local people, local families. So um, I can maybe give you a new perspective on this topic. I don't want to uh, go on. Should I give an introduction or? As you wish. Your audience. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'll just give a little introduction about me. Uh, I was born in India. Uh, by the way, if any of you don't understand something that I'm saying, please feel free to raise your hand and stop me. <laughs> I will try to speak slowly so you can understand. I also speak Spanish, so if there is something you don't understand, I can explain in Spanish. Although I think this is for you to better your English, right? So yeah, I was born in India. Uh, then at the age of 17, I got a scholarship and I left my country. I went to Singapore to do my junior college and my university over there. And uh, since then, I have been... Uh, traveling the world after I finished, I studied computer science. I graduated in computers like all of you are doing right now. Most of them, not all of them. Most, oh, most, most of them, them. okay. So after uh, graduating, I realized I wanted something more from life. I just didn't want to uh, stay in Singapore and work in a big corporation. I wanted to find myself. I wanted to experience myself. So I took up a student exchange program at my university and I started traveling. So I went to Europe, then I went to Africa. I was in Africa for one and a half years. Then I went to South America in Venezuela. I was there for two years. Then I came to Central America, Costa Rica. I did uh, two exchange programs here for three years. Then I published my first book here. And uh, after I published the book, uh, I was teaching here as an English teacher at Centro Cultural, actually. And uh, when I finished that, I published the book. And then a uh, lot of people started inviting me as a speaker uh, and a performer, I also started dancing. So I did a lot of dance shows, speaking events. Then I went to New York for some time. I did a documentary, some short films. Uh, then I went back to India for a few years. I wrote two new books. Uh, I published an inspirational journal. And uh, finally, I'm back now in Costa Rica just for a few months. And meanwhile, I did some TED Talks. I hope you know about TED Talks, right? Uh, so, uh, so that is more or less an introduction. Now, I want to hear from you. So you ask me questions and I will speak. So who has the first question? Somebody? Come on. Come on. Nobody has a question. For someone who's lived in so many yes. places. Okay. What did you do to balance your work life and normal life? No. What do I do to balance my work life and normal life? Okay, good question. Now, most people has a work life separately 
and normal life separately. But my life is my work and my work is my passion. So I don't see my work as work. It is like a living, breathing, eating, sleeping. Let's say I'm sleeping, I get an idea. So I do speeches on many different topics. I have two YouTube channels and uh, one is my book and speaking gigs and the other is my dances and fashion. So my dance channel has a lot of subscribers, more than 130,000 subscribers. But my book channel is just coming up. Uh, so what I do, when I am sleeping, let's say I get an idea for a new speech. So I get up, I write it down, then I go back to sleep. Uh, maybe I'm eating or, or I'm speaking with people. Then people tell me their problems. You know, and I get an idea for the next blog. Uh, I also have a blog. So I have a website and in my website I have a blog. So I get a new idea, then I write about it in my blog. And most of my topics are uh, advancing the evolution of human consciousness. So what is consciousness? It's being aware where you are, who you are. Now that uh, concept of consciousness can be very limited or it can be so big that it can encompass the whole world, right? Now it depends on how much you allow your consciousness to grow, to expand, right? Some people are just happy in their everyday life, you know, going to work, coming back home. Some people want to know the whole world, then they go traveling. Some people want to help others. So these are all different facets of our consciousness. So I work on making, expanding this consciousness so everything in life becomes easier. You are, you are not in a job that you hate. You are not in a career that you hate. You do something that you love. You love it so much that it doesn't feel like work. So I never have to balance anything because what I'm doing is what I'm passionate about. When I'm writing the book, it's because I had a dream. And that in that dream, I saw the story of the book. Then I woke up and I wrote the book. So can you imagine living like that? So that has literally been my reality ever since I left India. More questions? Yes. Okay. No, that is a good question because culture is very much related to war or peace. I was going to come to that. So similarities between Indian and Latin culture and differences. First of all, I come from a very conservative background. By conservative background, I mean that a woman has to cover her whole body and uh, she cannot expose herself in her mind. Uh, of course, um, we have very high level of education in India, but we still live in a patriarchal society, male dominated society, where no matter how high your education is, in the end you are still dominated by your husband or your father. And uh, nowadays, this is changing a lot, but uh, it still exists very much, especially in Calcutta, where I'm from. Uh, so one of my first culture shocks when I came to Latin America was the way the women dress up. For example, <laughs> I, I, I will just give you an example. So I live with a Mexican family here. 
and we have a maid who comes home to clean our house. And the maid comes in, you know, spaghetti clothes and mini skirt <laughs> with makeup and everything. And I look at her and I'm like, she's better dressed than I am. Like when I used to work here as an English teacher, I used to wear these long skirts and these, uh, you know, Indian tops, everything covered. But in India, you cannot find maid servants who are you know, so groomed and, you know, passion, this, that. So this was a big <laughs> culture shock. Also, uh, the way men and women bond here, it's very fast. But in India, it's very slow. So what do I mean by that? Here, in college, in school, you can have boyfriends, girlfriends. You can engage in sexual behavior. You even have kids in that age. But in India, if a girl does that, she's finished. <laughs> so ideally, you are not supposed to engage in sexual activities before marriage. Nowadays, that is changing. Younger and younger people have started to, you know, because of the internet and globalization and technology, people have boyfriends, girlfriends, it's normal. But still, in the capital of India, for example, in Delhi, if police finds a girl and a guy, young girl and a guy who are not married, holding hands or kissing in a car or something, the police can arrest them or find them. So, you or harass them to get a bribe. So, so this is uh, this is something you know. I'm born with, and uh, here, of course, it's a very open culture. So, this is a culture shock for me. But now I'm used to it. Now I think that my culture is not so good because you should not, you know, bind people like that. Uh, what is the food? Well, uh, Indian food, we have a lot of variety, a lot of spices. We have millions and millions of varieties of food. Every state in India has a different kind of food. Whereas here in Costa Rica, there are like four or five dishes, and that's all. You have casado, gallo pinto, chorizo. Uh, 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 what is that thing? Uh, no, no, no. Tormento monja. I'm forgetting it. It's something with cerdo. You have chicharrón. Yeah, chichar. So those five, six things, okay, and uh, uh, that. Uh, the, the raw, raw seafood, uh, ceviche. ceviche. So a few seafood and that's it. So I can count on a single hand how many dishes you have. But in India, if you go to India like the first day of the year, and if you leave India the last day of the year, and every day you eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and you never repeat a single dish, when you leave India after one year, you would not even have tried half the variety of the food that exists in the country. So you can imagine the difference. Okay, I won't go on because there are many, many differences and similarities, but I will take another question. Um, what's the thing you miss more from India? I don't miss any. <laughs> I don't miss India. Well, if at all I miss something, sometimes it's the food. But I cook, you know, so I can make anything Indian that I like. But what I miss, maybe someone cooking for me, you know, because I don't get all the ingredients here. Which is, which is your favorite country and why? Okay, that's a hard question to answer because um, every country that I have lived in, so I have been to nearly 30 countries, I have lived in 8 different countries and uh, across 5 continents, 
and uh, some countries uh, were very challenging and difficult like Nigeria some countries it was easier like Germany but everywhere I learned something that prepared me for the next voyage of my life so I didn't just travel and leave I lived in that country so when I was in Africa you know I lived there for one and a half years I experienced a very very intense life over there it was very dangerous no electricity for like 20 hours and you start thinking what is the meaning of life how do people survive in a country like Nigeria which has one of the leading world's oil producing countries and when I was there in 2007 we barely had electricity for two hours in a day so in that two hours you have to charge your phone you have to do everything and that electricity came in the middle of the night during the day no electricity if you are rich you can probably afford a generator and it makes that horrible sound throughout the day that your mental peace is gone. <laughs> and if you are poor, then you just wait until the electricity comes. Otherwise, you just accommodate yourself with the darkness. So um, that taught me a lot of things about myself. You know, we take so many things in life for granted. Whereas people in Nigeria, they say they are one of the happiest people on earth. You, you can go out on the street, you see these little kids, you know, they are always dancing on the, on the road. You know, they have this Nigerian music, very famous music. They play that music and people, kids are dancing, people are playing, you know. There is this warmth of connection among people which you don't see so much in the other countries because over there people are not always you know on their smartphones they have time to bond with each other to speak with each other to share a smile to share a laughter whereas here people are like 24 hours on the phone so people here are friendly and nice but you don't really share any real connection or bonding like I didn't experience much of that here so anyway so each place I lived I had a totally different experience something that I cannot even imagine you know and that is the beauty of that place so I cannot say that this place was better than that place even though one place may have been more challenging than other place but this place gave me the lessons that I needed to live in the other place. So it is like a continuation journey. It is like destiny. You know, the path to destiny. It's a voyage of the heart. Thank you. Now, I have another question. In yes. terms of peace, how do people in different countries it was just a figure of speech yeah. you know okay I, I get your question so uh, to answer your question uh, before we can understand peace we have to understand war now what creates war conflicting belief systems conflicting ideas do you know the meaning of conflict yeah so now let me tell you someone in africa believes in something okay someone in asia believes in something else for example in asia 
in India, when a guy marries a girl, the girl pays dowry. It's not officially paid anymore, but still, you know, the girl's parents, they have to give a lot of gold and uh, furniture and car and things like that to the, to the man's uh, family uh, for marrying their daughter. Whereas in Africa, the man pays the dowry to marry the girl. So basically, uh, what I'm trying to say is, having lived in all these different countries, I have realized that the biggest reason for war, be it the Middle Eastern war that is going on with America, be it uh, the fight, let's say I have a fight with him, the energy of war is the same. It is conflicting beliefs. So I believe in something and you believe in something else, right? Now we both have to live together. We will have conflict all the time and that creates war unless we decide to come to a higher level of consciousness which I told you about and I rise from my belief here and he rises from his belief here and this is where we can find peace. If we are here in our individual belief systems, we will not find peace. Now, what is a belief system? When you are born into this world, you are born into a specific family. Your mother, your father, your teachers, your guardians, they tell you, this is God. Jesus is God. So you have to believe in Jesus. This is your religion. This is your truth. This is right. This is wrong. Now, let's say I am born in another country. My mother tells me, Krishna is your God. You have to uh, believe in this. This is correct. You have to cover your face because you are a girl. This is wrong. You should not expose your body. So this is my belief system. So now what happens? These beliefs change from region to region city to city, country to country, continent to continent. And this is the basic reason for war because people believe this is true. There is no absolute truth in this world. But we are taught this is the absolute truth. When you have Samana Santa, you go to the church you worship Jesus because you have been told that Jesus is going to save your soul. And we have been told something else, you know. So what is true? We don't know. You will say Jesus is true. I will say Krishna is true. So now, let's say you and I have to work together. Then we have to find a higher level of understanding. Otherwise, we will be at war. So this is the same energy that is creating wars all across the world. It can be war among family members. It can be war among two religions like Hindus and Muslims in India. They are always fighting till today. Or it can be war among nations. Or it can be war in the whole world like we had the world wars. It is the same energy. But something magical is happening. And I want to maybe finish. We don't have much time, right? Yeah, but that's okay. Okay. So I want to talk about this magic, which I perceived during my travels across the world and through my work with consciousness. And I think you should hear it. First of all, you are, most of you are technology students. So technology is helping create peace. How? First of all, with internet and globalization, there is no boundaries between countries, at least in the virtual world, right? You may be on Facebook, you may be on Instagram, on YouTube, and you have access to people all over the world. So this is, in a way, shrinking the world. 
Now, the magic that is happening is more and more people are opening up. They are traveling. They are meeting different people. And they are falling in love. So let me explain this, okay? Let's say someone from Asia and someone from Latin America. They travel or, you know, they meet through social media, okay? They fall in love. When you love someone, you don't see any boundaries. All the belief systems, the garbage, the trash programming, the cultural... Um, conditioning that you have grown up with is gone because you are in this bubble where you love the other person so much that you don't care about the differences between you then what is happening let's say after you experience this love for a short period of time People are not able to sustain that energy. So they fall back into their belief systems, their ideologies, philosophies, cultural doctrines, religious dogmas. And the expectations are different, right? Because there are cultural differences. So let's say first you were here, two people. Then they fall in love, they come here. And then once they experience that love, they kind of fall. So there is a separation and they are somewhere here. They don't fall all the way back and they are not here. So now they are here and they go through intense pain and suffering because they want the other person but they are not able to get that other person because of their individual belief system is keeping them apart. So this is happening at a massive scale in the world today, where people are meeting, falling in love from different cultures and they're getting separated. You may never talk to that person again, but it causes an expansion in your soul. If you can overcome purge, cleanse your dysfunctional and disempowering belief systems that are inside you, then you may be able to come together because you have tasted what this is like before. But if you can't, or maybe one person is doing the work, the other person is not doing the work, then this one person may meet another person here. Or if both are doing the work, the individual work, which is purging all these limiting beliefs, cultural conditioning, trash programming, throwing away the garbage. There is a lot of garbage in our society. We don't need all that garbage. So if people can do that work, they may be able to come together in a union. So this is not a normal relationship that you see everywhere. This is a special kind of soul to soul connection and today on earth consciousness is not stable so very few people are able to come here together however in let's say 20 years time more people will be able to come because consciousness is changing rapidly people are opening up like the evolution of consciousness does not wait for anyone or anyone's belief systems. So more and more people will come together and slowly we will have a homogeneous world where you will have a mixture of all kinds of people, races, religion, belief system, custom, culture, creed, living together harmoniously. And this will happen when more people travel. When more people, like, you know, when I traveled, I did not live with Indians. Usually Indians, when they travel, they always stick to their groups. They don't mix up. But I always lived with the local family. I went to the church mass with them. I attended religious functions with them. I attended weddings with them. I had long conversations with them. So that way, I was 
perceiving all the belief systems of the world at an intimate level. So when more people do this, you cannot war on somebody you love. So you'll just find that your heart is expanding, your soul is expanding and you will stop judging people. Usually when we judge someone, he is wrong. Then you want to hurt him because he is wrong, right? And hurting someone is a form of war, right? So be it at a microcosm level or at a macrocosm level, the energy of war is the same and the energy of peace is the same. Every human being knows what is happiness, what is love, what is freedom, what is peace. So love, joy, freedom, peace, these are all synonymous words. You don't need different cultures to define it differently. Everybody knows what is love. Everybody knows what is freedom and what is not freedom. When I was born in Calcutta, I knew my upbringing did not give me any freedom. I live here, I like here, I know here I am free. So these are things, you know, uh, that you don't have to tell people, everybody knows. But what stops us from achieving that love, from achieving that happiness is that belief system that I am right, he is wrong. And that creates war. And that stops us from peace. So, my message to all of you will be, you all have your individual beliefs. But always try to expand your belief and see that everyone is right, given their model of the universe. In your perspective, in your mirror, you are correct. So everybody is correct. Now they may be limited in their perspective. Like in India, when I go to Calcutta, all those people in Calcutta, they judge me. They say, oh, look at this girl, what kind of dress she is wearing. <laughs> you know, they are correct. Because those women, they don't have the freedom to wear a dress like this. Right? So they are correct. But I cannot, you know, be friends with them. Because if I stay with them, we will end up fighting. <clears throat> Either I have to conform to their expectations or... We will fight. So find your own place in the world. But remember, when you travel, you see other cultures, you have this deep empathy, compassion for other humans. You see suffering everywhere. You see people, they are struggling inside their mind. You know, there are so many things. People are struggling with body image. People are struggling with family. People are struggling in their career. People are struggling with money. People are struggling with, um, you know, their relationship with their siblings. You know, so people are struggling in some form of their So when you have that thing,